Hi, this is Dr. A with a clinical chemistry review on your renal diseases. Okay, so let's start with the glomerular diseases because that's the beginning of your inflammation anyway. So the first one is acute glomerular nephritis in which you will see large inflamed glomeruli with a decreased capillary lumen. And um, with this, because it's an acute process, you will see a rapid onset of hematuria and proteinuria. Acute glomerular nephritis is often uh, like post-streptococcal and stuff. So um, then you also have chronic glomerular nephritis. So it's in this one you see glomerular scarring and of course then eventual loss of the functioning nephrons because scar tissue doesn't operate the way it's supposed to, right? The way the normal tissue does. And um, in this one, the evidence is going to be a gradual development of uremia that can be the first sign. So that's the accumulation of urea in the blood. So you would have an ele elevated blood urea nitrogen. And the causes of glomerular nephritis are group A strep, especially a cause of acute um, glomerular nephritis. Group A strep is the strep that gives you strep throat. But also um, amyloidosis, endocarditis, good pasture disease, mononucleosis, lupus, and many other. Also the excessive use of NSAIDs. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, things such as like ibuprofen and aspirin and stuff like that. Signs and symptoms are uh, proteinuria, so protein in the urine, edema, so swelling, the patient will have swelling in the face and all over the body, hematuria, blood in the urine, oliguria means a small amount of urine is being produced, and a high blood pressure. Also, you will see high BUN and creatinine. The next one is nephrotic syndrome. This is associated with massive proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia. So lots of protein is being dumped to the urine and therefore you're missing the protein in the blood. The main protein in the blood is albumin. And so you'll see hypoalbuminemia or low albumin levels in the blood. Then you'll also see edema because you have the low albumin and uh, it's uh, then the fluid is going to escape the cardiovascular system and go into the tissues. You will also see hyperlipidemia and hypercholesterolemia and lipiduria. Uh, it is linked to several underlying conditions uh, and is due to injury to the glomeruli and the two main conditions it's linked to are diabetes and lupus. An acute onset can occur if there's circulatory disruption to the kidneys. So maybe the patient goes in shock or something like that. Anyway, something that keeps the um, blood from flowing to the kidneys normally. Some forms of glomerular nephritis can progress to nephrotic syndrome and lipiduria results in the uh, excretion of fat bodies, which can be seen in a urinalysis. Next, we're going to talk about tubular diseases. That's the second stage in making urine. So, um, it's usually the result in decreased excretion or reabsorption of certain substances or uh, a reduced concentrating capability. So we have renal tubular acidosis, and those are disorders that affect acid-base balance. Um, it's usually can be due to either acquired or inherited disorders. Uh, and you have a failure to reabsorb bicarb or to secrete hydrogen ions, therefore that messes with acid-base balance. Um, the signs and symptoms are high chloride, metabolic acidosis with a normal anion gap and a normal glomerular filtration rate. Distal renal tubular acidosis is the most common in which you have a reduced hydrogen ion secretion in the distal convoluted tubule. The next one is proximal renal tubular acidosis. Um, it's, or uh, it's also known as type 2 RTA. It is an impaired bicarb reabsorption in that proximal convoluted tubule. And then top four renal tubular acidosis is a combined um, acidosis problem where you have impaired cation exchange in the distal convoluted tubule. Diabetes insipidus is failure of the tubular reabsorption of water and therefore you see an excretion of large volumes of very dilute urine and your patient is really thirsty all the time. Uh, and this is due to antidiuretic hormone. And so the role of aviation diabetes insipidus is uh, twofold. You can either have a decreased production of antidiuretic hormone, which would be neurogenic di, di diabetes insipidus. And that could be, for example, from anything that would damage the pituitary. So a blow to the head would be one thing that could cause that.
or you can see ADH resistance by the kidneys that's called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus where there is enough ADH that's being produced but the kidneys are simply not responding to it. Now as a side note um, diabetes insipidus is different from diabetes mellitus which is a sugar diabetes but why are they both called diabetes? Uh, it's because the root word for diabetes means in Greek means siphon and they both 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 types of diabetes present with signs and symptoms of um, polyuria and polydipsia so drinking lots and lots of water and producing copious amount of dilute urine so they have the same signs and symptoms back in the Greek ages so they just call it diabetes meaning siphon so again, the signs and symptoms of diabetes insipidus would be obviously polyuria, polydipsia, and nocturia. So having to get up and go pee in the middle of the night because you're producing so much urine, you can't even make it through the night. And uh, the diagnosis usually uses a 24-hour urine volume, which would then expect to be greatly increased. And then plasma and urine osmolality, which showing the urine really, really dilute. And the plasma being concentrated because you can't, Put the water back in the plasma and then of course your ADH levels which then would help you determine if it's going to be neurogenic or nephrogenic DI. Then there's also polycystic kidney disease so it's a genetic disorder and you get progressive destruction of the kidneys because a bunch of cysts are formed and um, it's the leading cause of kidney transplants obviously as the cysts are formed those areas of the kidneys aren't functioning properly. Urinary tract infections. So these can be an infection in either the kidneys or the urinary bladder. Cystitis is the inflammation of the bladder or an infection in the bladder. Um, palonephritis is an infection in the kidneys. So palonephritis is differentiated from cystitis by the presence of urinary casts on the urinalysis. Casts are formed in the kidneys and their presence then in the, in the case of kidney involvement. The risk factors are anything that blocks uh, urine flow and indwelling catheters, those are two big risk factors to get urinary tract infections. Uh, the symptoms are uh, fever and painful urination, although you can have a UTI and not have a fever, or you can have a UTI with fever and not have painful urination, it's totally possible. And the treatment is antibiotics that are usually appropriate for whatever bacteria are growing in the sample. Renal obstruction, their urine flow is blocked. Uh, causes can be kidney stones, enlarged prostate, tumors, blood clots, or scars. Um, calculi or kidney stones are formed uh, by a combination of various crystallized substances. Some of the examples are, for example, cal calcium oxalate, uh, where you have a high urine calcium or high vitamin D, which leads to usually high calcium. Uh, and they make these little envelope shaped uh, crystals that are kind of neat. Um, if you have high uric acid due to gout, you'll see uric acid crystals. Um, calcium phosphate crystals are usually due to excess alkali consumption. So alkali could be things like taking too many ant antacids. Uh, so usually the diagnosis for that, you need some imaging to see what's blocking the flow of urine. Um, a urinalysis could obviously reveal the presence of these crystals and stuff. Do be and creatinine levels to see how the kidneys are functioning and uh, what blood cell count. Uh, looking at what cells in the urine, but also what cells in the blood. Diabetic nephropathy is worth mentioning here. So uh, in diabetes mellitus, you have chronic high blood glucose levels and um, the high blood glucose and also the high insulin to on the side uh, causes damage to the kidneys. Um, so d this damage is called nephropathy and it decreases renal function. And the microalbumin is used to detect early proteinuria. And so microalbumin meaning it is picking up really, really low levels of albumin, which could normally be missed by a dipstick. If diagnosed early, then the renal function decline can be slowed. It's slowed by uh, managing the diabetes better. Uh, and of course, it, but if the diabetes is not well managed and this, uh, re the renal function is not well managed either, then it can lead to chronic kidney disease. All right, and then renal failure. Uh, the definition of kidney failure is a glomerular filtration rate of 15 mils per minute or less or a creatinine creatinine clearance of less than 10 mils per minute. Um, acute renal failure is sudden sharp decline in renal function. So it 
uh, appears out of nowhere in a way, uh, it can have different causes. So a pre-renal cause of acute renal failure would be hypoperfusion, so a lack of blood supply to the kidney. So maybe a trauma patient that had a massive blood loss, then you could go into pre-renal uh, acute renal failure. Renal or intrinsic acute renal failure, there's um, it's systemic and progressive kidney diseases, so um, things that damage the functioning of the kidneys themselves. Post renal acute renal failure um, are, you, are due to structural abnormalities or calculi, so like a kidney stone or a tumor in the urinary tract, uh, so it causes a Block, block of flow of the urine, which then backs up into the kidney and causes kidney damage. Once the cause is determined and resolved, often a renal failure can be reversed. It just kind of depends on a case-by-case -case basis, and the trick is to catch the renal failure early enough. Um, chronic renal failure is a gradual decline in renal function over time. This is the one that's usually associated with things like hypertension and diabetes mellitus and stuff. Renal hypertension is high blood pressure that is caused by a decreased perfusion to the kidneys. So, so for example, if you have some plaque or calcifications in the arteries that are leading to the kidneys, then there will less, the kidneys is receiving less blood and in return is going to increase your blood pressure and that leads then to renal hypertension. So that is definitely something worth investigating if a patient has high blood pressure. Um, so the diagnosis of renal failure is a decreased glomerular filtration rate, azotemia, which is going to be increased in BUN and creatinine uh, in the blood, oliguria, so a production of small amounts of urine, and the patients also often have edema. Your characteristic lab results are going to be a BUN above 50 milligrams per deciliter, so that is azotemia, with a uh, creatinine greater than 3.0 milligrams per deciliter. Normally, a creatinine level is like around 1, so this is already three times normal. Uh, and then, especially with acute renal failure, you will see potassiums of six point above 6.5 milliequivalents per liter, so that is already elevated. Uh, the top of normal for potassium is around 5 and a hemoglobin of less than 10 grams per deciliter. The therapy of acute renal failure is going to be dialysis to remove waste from the blood by an external synthetic membrane. Here's a dialysis machine. And the therapy of end-stage renal disease is going to be either dialysis or transplantation. And that is it for your diseases.